To get his take on what's happening in the oil industry, I sat down with Richard Heinberg, senior fellow at the Post Carbon Institute. Now, in this segment, Richard and I spoke about the gains that Americans have made in disposable income. This October was the best October in a decade for auto sales, including an increase in truck and SUV sales. So I first asked Richard if this is a good thing or a bad thing. Here's what he had to say. Well, there's an old adage, a fool and his money are soon parted. Um, you know, buying a, a large vehicle, if you don't actually need one for, for your, your business right now, is just not a good idea. Yes, we are seeing lower gasoline prices, <clears throat> lower oil prices currently, but how long is this going to last? You know, globally, costs of production in the oil industry are increasing at about 11% per year. This is from analysis by Douglas Westwood. So if costs of production are increasing that fast, how long can the prices remain low? Well, uh, I suppose in, in the case of a strong economic downturn and lasting you know, recession, prices could remain low for, for some time. But under those circumstances, would you want to have a big vehicle, a, a gas guzzler, uh, when you could have a much more economic vehicle? You know, it just doesn't make any economic sense uh, to be buying these these gas guzzlers at this point, and uh, I suppose there's some pent up demand from people who you know always wanted to have one, and now that they see gas gasoline prices going down, they think, well, now's my big chance. But you know, if these people took a longer view, uh, they'd realize this is a very stupid thing. So, is it that we're reaching a peak of oil production, or that industrialized societies will have less net energy available? every year despite alternative sources of fuel. What is it? Well, it's both. Uh, actual gross oil production is likely to peak within the next couple of years. But then you, you mentioned net energy. That's actually even more significant. Uh, it's taking us more energy to get energy these days. You have to invest energy for, uh, for drilling, for mining, uh, for building solar panels and, and wind turbines before you can get energy back. And the ratio between the amount of energy that you invest and the amount of energy that's returned at the end of the day is very important for society. We need an energy return ratio uh, probably in the range of 10 to 15 to 20 to 1 to operate uh, anything like our current scale of industrial economy. And the energy return ratio is falling as the uh, amount that has to be invested in oil production increases. As we rely more and more on uh, sources of energy that have an inherently low net energy profile like biofuels, the total uh, energy return on energy invested ratio for society is declining pretty rapidly. Uh, that's going to have economic impacts that, uh, that ripple all throughout um, our, our economy and our, our way of life over time. Uh, we, will, we will see uh, really energy intensive um, industries like uh, aircraft uh, manufacturing, tourism and the airline industries begin to suffer more. Uh, we will see economies begin to localize more as long distance transport of goods becomes uh, more relatively more costly. All of these things are fairly predictable, but uh, so far, you know, it's, it's hard to see folks actually understanding and preparing just because they're, they're so much more fixated on money and measures of money like GDP than they are on energy, which is what actually makes society run. It's really fascinating. Richard, in terms of alternative energy sources like nuclear, like wind, like solar, they all have pluses and they all have minuses. But how do these compare cost-wise to natural gas, oil, and each other? You, you kind of just touched upon it, but can you expand for us, please? Right. Well, um, we have two major sectors of energy consumption. One is liquid fuels, which is uh, for transportation primarily. Uh, and the other sector is electricity. And uh, there are a number of energy sources that can produce electricity for us, including nuclear, natural gas, coal, in some countries, oil. 
uh, as well as renewable sources like uh, hydropower, solar, and wind. But in the transport sector, we really are tied almost entirely to one energy source, source which is oil. Now, the prospects for substituting out electricity are much better than the prospects for substituting oil. Yes, electric cars are out there. There's still a minuscule <clears throat> proportion of the whole fleet, but uh, there at least is the possibility of, of building them out. Electric airliners are not a possibility. Electric cargo ships, no. And biofuels are not a long, uh, good long-term solution from an energy economics point of view. Uh, so in the electricity sector, uh, natural gas is getting more expensive, uh, especially outside the U.S. The U.S. has had cheap natural gas for the last few years as a result of the fracking boom. But that boom is, is about to go bust, and, uh, and so we'll see more costly natural gas here in this country. So that would seem to provide a lot of incentives for, for solar and wind, but it's going to take a long time to make that energy transition. And uh, it's going to help enormously if it's driven by policy rather than by the market. If we wait for the market to drive the policy, it's, it's going to be pretty chaotic because we'll, we'll be getting... Um, chaotic price signals. Uh, prices will not be stable either for fossil fuels or for alternatives. And it'll be hard for uh, investors to, to make sound decisions. And that's kind of where we... That was Richard Heinberg, Senior Fellow at the Post Carbon Institute.